So thank you very much for this very kind introduction. It's a great privilege to be here this afternoon for me. I know probably it's not afternoon for many of you. Um, as Peter mentioned, I used to be a PhD student at, at Teachers College and I have very fond memories of this and I'm very grateful to the program and faculty uh, to help me develop as a researcher and I've also made many good friends while I was at TC. So I hope you'll do the same if you're also a student at, at Teachers College. Okay, so let me get down to my talk. Uh, the title of my presentation is Investigating Second Language Writing Processes, Methodical Advances, and challenges. What made me interested in this topic to begin with? I'm primarily an instructed second language acquisition researcher, and within this area, the bulk of my research has been situated in the context of task-based language teaching so far. A common thread from my and my collaborators' previous work has been a primary focus on the product of task performance. In other words, we tended to assess second language development and performance by exclusively looking at linguistic outcomes at a certain point in time and before or after our instructional treatment. This is still typical of much of task-based research. Research on the processes that underlie task performance is still scarce. More and more researchers, however, realize that in addition to looking at the product of task-based performance, it's also important to examine the processes that underline task-based production and task-based development. Why is it important to look at task-based processes, the cognitive processes in which language learners engage? Well, it's important for theory building. When we assess theoretical models of second language performance and development, it's not sufficient to look at linguistic products. It's also crucial to provide evidence for the processes that underline those cognitive processes. Otherwise, we might fall into the trap of construct underrepresentation. To give you an example relevant to this talk, when a second language writer pauses while composing an essay, as we will see, might be a reflection of a number of underlying cognitive processes. For example, it might be associated with problems not knowing what to say or struggling with linguistic encoding processes, such as looking for the right lexis or grammatical, linguist, uh, grammatical construction. For building and testing theoretical models of second language writing, it makes a significant difference which of these two processes underline a pause produced by the writer. Second, if we look at task-based processes, it might also give information about the underlying cognitive processes which may enable educators to adjust, uh, to adjust second language instruction to meet students' needs. To continue with the previous example, it's likely that a learner who is struggling primarily with planning content will benefit from differential instruction than a learner who is struggling with linguistic encoding processes. What words to use? What grammar should I use? Against this background, part of my recent work has aimed at exploring the behaviors and the cognitive processes in which second language writers engage when they perform second language tasks. Among the various theoretical models which have been developed for writing, my collaborators and I have used Kellogg's cognitive model of writing as a theoretical basis for our research. This cognitive model describes writing in terms of three processes, formulation, execution, and monitoring. Formulation involves planning the content of the written piece and also translating into linguistic form. Translating ideas into linguistic form entails the sub-processes of lexical retrieval, syntactic encoding, and expression of cohesion. In the execution stage, motor movements are employed to produce either a handwritten or a typed text. Finally, monitoring involves ensuring that the resulting text is an adequate expression of the writer's intended content. This cognitive model describes writing as an interactive and recursive process. In other words, these processes are assumed to happen in parallel. But how can we this, uh, test this and other theoretical models of writing? When testing this and other models of second language writing, Researchers have mostly relied on introspective protocols, such as the think aloud and stimulated recall procedure. 
Think Aloud protocols involve participants in thinking aloud as they performing a set of specified tasks. Participants are asked to say whatever comes into their mind as they complete the task. The advantage of this technique is the fact that it provides concurrent data. It's online, so there is no memory decay. It has the disadvantage of, have a, uh, of uh, disadvantage, however, that it might produce reactivity. The process of thinking aloud might change the cognitive processes in which writers engage. In our research, we used a stimulated recall to examine writing processes. This is an offline procedure to tap the thoughts and cognitive processes participants had during task performance, and this happens via a recall session. Usually some tangible reminder of the event, like a visual stimulus, is used to stimulate recall. This technique has the advantage of not being reactive, but it has the disadvantage of memory decay. We might not remember everything that we were thinking while we engaged in the actual activity. Probably due to the limitations associated with verbal reports, more recently researchers have also begun to use keystroke logging, either alone or in combination with verbal reports, to capture second language writing processes. Keystroke logging tools register all the keystrokes and mouse movements that writers produce. Then the log data can be made available for further analysis, such as fluency, pausing, and revision behaviors. This technique has the advantage of being non-obtrusive. It's ecologically valid with just type of A as we would normally do, but it has the disadvantage of not being able to capture reading processes while we engage in writing. A way to address this limitation is to combine keystroke logging with eye checking methodology. What is eye checking? Eye checking involves recording an individual's eye fixations in other words, the moment-to-moment -moment, uh, movements of one's gaze while interacting with a visual stimulus. We are interested not only where the person is looking, that is the locus of eye fixations, but also the order in which the eyes move from one place to the next, also the little jumps or short circuits between fixations, and how long the duration is of each of these fixations. Eye fixations are the primary way in which humans take in visual information. The assumption underlying eye checking methodology is that the locus, sequence, and duration of eye fixations will reflect the attentional processes in which individuals engage when we encode and interpret visual information. These three methods have rarely been used in combination so far. I believe that my core researchers and I are among the first to explore how triangulating this, uh, that these various sources may provide information about writing processes. Now what I'm going to do is describe two studies which utilize these techniques together. I'll be focused on the methodological aspects of these studies. The aim of the first study was to explore the processes that underline the posing behaviors of second language writers. This was a joint project with Maria Michel from the University of Groningen and Min Jin Lee from Yonsei University in Korea. Min Jin was my PhD student at the time when we conducted the study. Our research questions were as follows. What is the nature of the cognitive processes that underline the posing behaviors of second language writers as reflected in stimulated recall comments and participants' eye gaze data? Our participants were 30 Chinese second language users of English. They were international students at the University of London, and they had IELTS scores seven or higher. There were 27 females and three males, and the mean age was around 27 years. All participants performed one version of the IELTS academic writing task two. While writing, their online writing process were recorded by the keystroke logging software input log. In addition, their eye gaze, da eye gaze data were collected using a Toby TX mobile eye checker. Participants also did a short typing test, and a subset of 12 students participated in a stimulated recall interview after task performance. Part of the stimulated recall protocol, participants watched the screen recording of their own writing performance. 
they were encouraged to stop the recording at any time, but we also stopped the recording and elicited participants' thoughts when they paused or revised their, um, their production. Participants had access to their eye gaze movements while we conducted the stimulated recall. These were conducted in English. The larger project also included a battery of working memory tests, but I won't be reporting on the results of these today. Moving on to data analysis, this is an example of one type of output that the input log, so input log software generates. This might look a bit scary, but don't worry, you can also get some automatic indices uh, from this software. What input log, uh, the type of information that input log can provide uh, is as follows. It records the actual text written, as you can see on the screen, what is kept and what is revised. It also indicates the location and length of pauses during the writing process. The threshold for pauses in our study was 2000 milliseconds. And as you can see here, there was a pause between the words history and end, and the length of that pause was 3, uh, 7348 milliseconds. Input log also keeps track of what function keys were used. In this case, the participant basically deleted almost everything they've written. There is a lot of back function here. Pausing behavior in our study was expressed in terms of a number of pauses per hundred words and mean length of pauses. Pauses were also classified according to whether they occurred within words, between words, between clauses, between sentences, or between paragraphs. Our rationale for looking at pause location was that from previous research, we know that pausing at lower textual locations tend to be associated with lower level writing processes, such as looking for the right vocabulary, spelling, and morphology. When it comes to the stimulated recall comments, we categorize these according to Kellogg's model of writing. We grouped comments into planning-related comments, translation-related comments, and monitoring-related comments. Here comes an example for a planning-related comment. I was thinking what examples I was going to write, what points should I make? An example for organization. I was thinking of how to structure the essay. I didn't type all the main points for each paragraph. I would give different paragraphs to different topics. Here's an example for lexical retrieval. Because I've already used the word discussions, I was trying to think of another word which has the same meaning. Syntactic encoding. Hmm, I was thinking whether I should treat study abroad as a singular or plural form. And expression of cohesion. I was thinking about link linking words I should use. Second is, a second is a boring one, should I use that? And finally, an example for a monitoring comment. I want to maybe go back to the beginning and check one time whether I should include anything. Moving on to the eye checking analysis, what we did in the input log software, first we identified pauses. Again, these were defined as silences or a lack of keystrokes longer than 2000 milliseconds. Then in the eye checking software, we also identified the position uh, of the pause and then reviewed the eye gaze behavior during that pause. What we coded for that the participants looked at the previous word or phrase they have produced or the previous clause, the sentence, paragraph, or they looked somewhere off screen or elsewhere. Let me show this to you. So here comes an example um, that participants during the pause went back, looking, went back to the previous sentence. The red dots here indicate eye fixations and the little lines between the red dots were examples for saccades. I show you another example here. This time, during the pause, but the participants went back in the previous paragraph they have produced. Again, in the absence of eye checking, we would have no idea uh, where participants were looking, what they were reading during the pause. And just a last example, Oops, I just showed you the same one. So let me go to my next slide. So here comes the last example. And as you will see, the participant went back to the instruction and also part of the text in the previous paragraph. So I think now you have an idea how we coded the data. For example, these eye movements were coded here as looking at the instruction and going back in the paragraph 
during the pause. So let me move on to the results. First, I will look at participants' stimulated recall comments and what they tell us about pausing behaviors. This graph summarizes the stimulated comments made by the participants. And on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see the pause locations, whether the comments were related to pauses made within words, between words, or between sentences. On the right-hand side, you can see how often the participants refer to various cognitive processes, such as planning content, linguistic encoding or translation, and monitoring. As you can see, participants focused on linguistic encoding processes or translation when they paused within words. When it comes to pauses between words, most comments related to linguistic encoding as well translation processes, but a small number of comments also refer to planning content or organization. And finally, pauses between sentences largely concerned planning content and organization, and a smaller number of comments refer to translation, linguistic encoding, or monitoring processes. In some pausing at higher textual units, such as sentences, was more likely associated with planning, whereas pausing at lower units, such as between words and within words, were more likely associated with translation processes. Again, translation refers to linguistic encoding processes. Let's move on to the eye gaze data now. This graph summarizes the eye gaze data, again by pause location. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can see the pause locations again, whether the comments relate, whether the eye checking data related to pauses within words, between words, or between sentences. On the right-hand side, you can see where participants looked when they paused, whether they stayed at the point of inscription where our cursor is, or whether they looked at the previous word, the clause, sentence, or paragraph during the pause. As you can see, no clear pattern emerges for within word pauses. Participants looked at previous word clause sentences or, or the previous word with similar frequencies. When it comes to between word pauses, in most cases, participants looked at the previous clause followed by the previous word. When participants pause between sentences, the pattern is clearer. They most often look back at the previous sentence. So putting this together, it seems like that pausing at higher texture units was more likely associated with eye gaze behaviors, visiting larger texture units, such as sentences, and pauses between lower units, such as within words and between words, were more likely associated with eye gazes visiting lower texture units, such as um, words or between or, um, um, or clauses. So if we put this together, um, what we can see that both the keystroke logging and eye gaze data suggest that pausing at higher texture units is associated with viewing larger texture units. And the stimulated recall common found that pausing at higher texture units were associated with higher order writing processes. Thus, all three data sources seem to converge on the finding that pausing at higher texture units was more associated with higher order writing processes. This is not really a new finding, but what is novel about this study is that we were able to confirm this trend through various data sources. This means that our findings are more reliable and more valid. And it means our conclusions are more valid, of course, as well, of course. This study had a number of limitations and it also led to some further research directions. Our pause threshold was 2000 milliseconds, which is a relatively long pause threshold. So we wanted to look at also shorter pauses. There was a relatively low temporal resolution of the eye checker we used, 60 Hertz, that doesn't count as a very good eye checker anymore. We also obtained relatively rough eye checking measures. We obtained our eye checking measures through qualitative coding. We didn't consider the temporal dimension of writing. So there are replication studies which are needed to deal with some of these limitations, but it would also be interesting, we thought, to consider how L2 writers might differ across different levels of proficiency and also different task types. In our next study, we attempted to address some of these limitations. We investigated the effects of proficiency 
and writing stage, the temporal dimension of writing on second language writing processes. Like in our previous research, we triangulated various sources, including keystroke logging, eye checking, and stimulated recall methodology. My collaborators on the project were again Maria Michelle, Shia Jun Lu, Nektaria Kurtali, and Lars Borges. All of these students, except for Maria, again were my PhD students when we conducted the study. In terms of writing processes, our focus was on speed fluency, how fast writers produce language, posing behaviors, again, where, how long, and how often writers pose, and also what their thoughts were when they posed. And we also looked at eye gaze behaves, uh, behaviors again, how often and long writers fixated on the screen, and how often and how far they jumped, how often um, there were saccades between fixations on the page. Again, the theoretical basis for our study was Kellogg's model of writing. So what are the implications of this model for the relationship between proficiency and writing processes? Given that higher proficiency writers have more automatized linguistic skills, we predicted that due to working memory limitations, they would be more able to handle any competing demands between planning, translation, and monitoring processes. We expected that this would result in decreased speed fluency, slower writing, also less frequent and shorter pauses, especially at lower texture units. Remember, pauses at such locations have been shown to be associated with linguistic encoding processes, and we would expect lower proficiency writers to struggle uh, more with linguistic encoding processes. We also expected less local viewing behaviors by higher proficiency writers, as they would have more resources left to engage in monitoring and rereading to generate content. This would involve going further back in previously written text. Previous studies have confirmed these predictions for internal composing processes, also speed of writing. For pauses, the findings appear to be mixed. In the single eye checking study the, um, that have looked into the relationship between proficiency and writing processes yielded no meaningful relationships between rereading and proficiency. Besides proficiency, we were also interested in exploring whether writers at various levels of proficiency would engage in different writing processes at the beginning, in the middle, or at the end of the writing process. For example, would lower high proficiency writers plan more at the beginning? In the current study, we operationalize writing stage as dividing the writing process into five equal time intervals. For example, if a participant wrote for 13 minutes, each stage took about 60 minutes. So stage one, 16, six minutes, stage two, six minutes, and so on. Roca de Larios and his colleagues have suggested that high proficiency learners may be better able to decide which writing activities to focus on at what point during writing. Some empirical studies have provided empirical evidence in support of this. Proficient writers have been found to plan more towards the beginning of writing and spend more time monitoring in later stages of writing. Pilana, however, found no evidence for this trend. In light of these findings, we uh, expected that in the early and later stage of writing, higher proficiency writers um, they'll show lower speed fluency. They will engage in more frequent and longer pauses as planning and monitoring involves less intensive writing. We also expected that there would be less local viewing behavior, um, maybe more jumps within the text as writers will probably be reviewing their work from beginning to the end. There might also be shorter fixations as writers will be rereading text that they are already familiar with and if you're reading something that you're familiar with, you might not need to engage in such deep processing, which might lead to shorter fixations. Previous research have found a relationship between depth of processing and length of fixations. We, pull, we pose the following research questions. Number one, to what extent does proficiency predict the speed fluency, pausing, and eye gaze behaviors of second language writers and pause-related cognitive processes. So our independent variable was proficiency, and our dependent variables were speed fluency, pausing and associated cognitive processes, and eye gaze behavior. 
years. Our second research question asked, to what extent does stage of writing influence the extent to which proficiency predicts the speed fluency, pausing, and argues behaviors of second language writers, and again, pause-related cognitive processes? So this time we were interested in the moderating effect of writing stage on the links between proficiency and writing behaviors and processes. Simply put, depending on the stage of writing, do more proficient writers show different writing behaviors and processes from less proficient writers? Our participants this time were 60 Chinese Air2 users of English who altogether produced 120 writing performances, actually 240 in the larger study, but I'll be focusing on 120 in the present study. They were all international students at the University of London. They came from various levels of proficiency. 20 student, students were CFRC1, 20 CFRB2, and 20 CFRB1. This was determined by the TOEFL IBT listening and reading components. The mean age of the participants was around 24 and the majority were female. The operationalized proficiency as participants combined reading and listening TOEFL score. What did the participants do? First, they took part in a group session in a computer lab they were administered the TOEFL IBT listening and reading components, followed by a typing test. Next, two individual sessions followed in our eye checking lab. In both sessions, participants performed two TOEFL IBT writing tests, altogether four tasks. While they were writing, we used the keystroke logging software Input Log 7 to track their keystrokes, and participants' eye movements were also recorded by an iLink 1000 eye checker. This is a much more sophisticated eye checker than we used in our previous research. Finally, participants engaged in a stimulated recall session. Out of the four TOEFL IBT writing tasks that participants performed, two were integrated and two were independent writing tasks. The order of the four tasks was counterbalanced across participants and sessions. In this study, we focused on the independent tasks. Independent tasks took the form of essays. Participants were asked to write an argumentative essay on a given topic. They had 30 minutes to do so. And the task instruction asked them to consider whether they agreed or disagreed with a statement. And they were also asked to use specific examples and reasons to support their answer. The stimulated recall was based on the last writing task that participants performed. It took, exact, it took exactly the same format as in our previous study, but this time, since we had an um, RA who was able to speak uh, Mandarin Chinese, these were conducted in Mandarin. So this was also an improvement on the previous study. We obtained the speed fluency and pausing measures with input log. Again, we calculated two indices of speed fluency, characters per P burst. These are the number of characters produced by participants between pauses. And we also captured active writing time. This is the mean duration of character production. We obtained this measure by calculating the total time spent writing, excluding pauses. And then we divided this by the number of characters that uh, writers type. Our pausing measures were the same as in our previous research. We considered pause length and pause frequency by various pause locations again, building on previous research. We conducted the eye checking analysis with the help of SR Data Viewer. Our interest area was the writing window in the TOEFL writing environment. To define our interest periods, the stages of writing, we divided the writing session into five equal time intervals. As I mentioned earlier, if a participant wrote, for example, for 30 minutes, we considered separately the first six minutes, the second six minutes, and so on. And of course, we also looked at the total writing process, writing process as a whole. Then in the second step, we extracted the following eye-checking indices for the full writing process, plus the five interest periods. Fixation counts. This is the number of times participant fixated on the screen. Also, fixation time the amount of time they spent fixated on the screen, the median length of each fixation, how long each fixation was on average, 
The number of forward and backward saccades, remember saccades are the jumps that learners make when they look at uh, the screen, have often participants jump forward or backwards in the evolving text. We also looked at the median length of forward and backward saccades, how long these saccades were, how long these jumps were that participants uh, made while, uh, during writing. And finally, we calculated the proportion of backward saccades. This indicated whether participants have jumped or moved more backwards or forwards during the writing process. When it comes to the stimulated recall comments, we analyze them in the same way as in our previous research. Before presenting the results, let me just remind you of the first research question. Here we were concerned with the effects of proficiency on speed fluency, posing behaviors, and associated cognitive processes, and as well, uh, and eye gaze behaviors as well. To address the effects of uh, proficiency on writing behaviors, we ran a series of multi-level multi -level mixed models using the R statistical environment. Our dependent variable was a measure of posing or an eye gaze behavior in each analysis. Our random effects were participant and prompt, and the fixed effect in our, in our analysis was proficiency. When it comes to the stimulated recall comments, we ran a series of simple regression analyses. Our predictor was proficiency. And the dependent variable was the proportion of post related stimulated recall comments, either on planning, translation, or monitoring. Out of the 18 writing behavior indices, only proficiency emerged as a significant uh, predictor for three measures only number of characters per p burst, median pause length between words, and number of pauses between sentences. We found no proficiency effects for eye gaze behaviors and stimulated recall comments. In particular, we found that more proficient writers overall wrote faster. They produced more characters per p burst. They produced shorter pauses between words, but paused more frequently between sentences. Again, the eye gaze data and stimulated recall uh, data yielded no proficiency effects. Let me just illustrate these findings for one of the speed fluency measures. This graph represents the relationship between proficiency and the number of characters produced between pauses. As you can see, the horizontal axis represents proficiency and the vertical axis, the number of characters per p burst. As you can see, as proficiency increased on the horizontal axis, the number of characters produced by test participants also increased the little circles indicate individual performances. Again, higher proficiency writers basically wrote faster. They produce more characters per p burst. Our findings for research question one were only partly aligned with our expectations. Um, it, they were only confirmed for speed fluency and some of the posing indices. Our second research question, just to remind you, was concerned with the moderating effect of writing stage on the relationship between proficiency and writing behaviors and underlying cognitive processes. We conducted exactly the same statistical analysis as for research question one. The only difference was that instead of one, we had three predictors in the models now. We had proficiency, writing stage, and the interaction between proficiency and writing stage. Our predictor of interest in the analysis was the interaction between, between proficiency and writing stage, as a significant interaction would mean that depending on proficiency, participants engage in differential writing processes. What we found, um, that there was um, proficiency stage interaction as a significant predictor for nine measures. Uh, these are listed here, two speed fluency measures, um, pause length between words and in total, mean fixation length, and planning related comments and monitoring related comments within words and in total. We found that more proficient writers wrote slower in the last stage of writing. They produced fewer characters per p burst. They also paused longer in later stages of writing. More proficient writers also produced shorter mean fixations later stages of writing. And the stimulated recall comments found 
that participants with higher proficiency produced more planning and monitoring related comments in earlier stages. Sorry, they produce more planning related comments in earlier stages of writing and more monitoring related comments in later stages of writing. Let me demonstrate these relationships just for a couple of measures. Let's look at characters per p burst and also the monitoring related comments um, that we gained. This figure illustrates the results between proficiency and characters per p burst. On the horizontal axis, again, you can see proficiency, and the vertical axis shows the number of characters per p burst. Each line in the, in the paragraph represents a stage. The mixed effects analysis revealed a significant difference between stages one and five, two and five, three and five, and four and five. As you can see, indeed the orange slope, hopefully you can see the orange slope that indicates stage five, is actually less steep as proficiency increases than the rest of the lines, which represents the earlier stages. This means that as proficiency increased, participants displayed less speedy writing in stage five as compared to earlier stages. Let me also show you another graph for monitoring related comments. Again, what you can see here on the horizontal axis, there is proficiency. On the vertical axis is the proportion of monitoring related comments. Um, emerging from the stimulated recall. The mixed effects model yielded a significant stage difference between stages two and four. So what you can see here, stage two is indicated by the blue line and stage four is by the purple line. These two are crossing each other. So this shows as proficiency increased, participants made more money relating comments at stage four. Um, there is an upward uh, slope uh, then stage two, when there is a downward slope. So for research question two, the findings were in line with our predictions largely, but I should also say that some of our predictions were not borne out. Not everything we predicted appeared in the data set. Now I won't go into a more detailed discussion of these finding, findings, as I'd like to spend the remaining part of this talk discussing methodological issues, as I promised in the abstract. So from a methodological perspective, what was interesting and reassuring to see in this study as well, just as in our previous research, that the free data sources provided converging and complementary perspectives on the writing process. All free data sources suggested that more proficient writers engaged in less intensive text production and more monitoring in later stages of writing. For example, slower writing and longer pauses are both consistent with the participants stimulated recall comments that they engage in more monitoring. When one monitors their output, text productions tends to be slower and pauses longer between writing, as monitoring involves rereading of previously written text. The stimulated recall comments are also aligned with the eye checking data. Remember, the eye checking data yielded shorter fixations in the last stage of writing. Shorter fixations have been argued to indicate less deep processing, as I mentioned earlier, and it's likely that processing of um, a text that one has produced earlier may require less deep processing than the production of new information. Unfortunately, we could not triangulate the pausing and eye checking behaviors uh, directly in this study. The sample, the fonts in the TOEFL environment were too small to arrive at reliable findings. Now let's bring this all together and consider what methodological implications we can derive from the two studies together. It appears that triangulating data from keystroke logging, eye checking, and stimulated recall allowed us to gain complementary and converging evidence about writing processes in both studies. The keystroke logs provide information about observable writing behaviors. By the means of keystroke logging data, we were able to assess how long students paused, and we were also able to identify whether they paused uh, within words, between words, or between sentences. As mentioned earlier, while this technique had the advantage of being concurrent and unobtrusive, 
Keystroke key logging would have provided us with no information about writers' viewing behaviors during pauses. This would have been an important limitation as rereading during writing, for example, is a key writing process. We often reread text when, this, when we write to generate new ideas and to monitor our performance. Eye checking helped us to address this limitation. The use of eye checking allowed us to gather information about participants' viewing behaviors. We inspected their participants were looking when they paused. Although having the advantage of being concurrent and unobtrusive, um, eye checking could provide no evidence about participants' thought processes. The stimulated recall, recalls helped us examine the conscious processes in which participants engaged. Again, if we had used only one of these methods, our conclusions would have been much more speculative about writing processes, and of course, as a result, less valid as well. All right, let me get to the summary uh, of this talk. And I also like to um, end with some recommendations for future research directions. First, I have argued that we should put greater emphasis on investigating writing processes. These are important, not only from the um, perspective of theory building, but they might also provide interesting insights for pedagogy. And I introduced a few methods that can be used to tap writing processes. To demonstrate these methods, I introduced two studies using various data sources, keystroke logging, stimulated recall methodology, and eye checking. And I concluded that it is best to combine these methods in order to overcome the limitations of each and thereby obtain fuller and more valid picture of writing processes. Now let me turn to some recommendations for future research with a methodical lens in mind. Future studies might want to carry out more sophisticated triangulation of data sources. In studies of writing processes so far, researchers have usually obtained separate group level summaries from the various data collection methods. For example, in our writing research, we have obtained group level statistics from the keystroke logging, eye checking, and stimulated recall measures. And then, the, then we triangulated these overall patterns. In the future, it would be helpful to conduct studies that triangulate various data sources at the individual data as well. This would help us achieve even more accurate interpretations. Probably a case study approach would be appropriate for this. Future research would also benefit from even more detailed time-locked analysis of the process data. For example, we could calculate eye checking indices or keystroke locking indices for every minute or even every second of the writing task. In this way, we could reveal information about processing on a moment to moment basis. This is important given the dynamic nature of writing performance. We have started making steps in this direction. I've just described a study where we divided the writing process into five stages but more detailed analyses are warranted in future research. I think it would be also interesting to combine behavioral techniques with neuroscience methods. This would allow us to tap brain activity during writing. Why brain activity? Well, one reason for this could be that it could um, shed light on implicit processes that we still have no access to. Eye checking might provide some information on implicit processes such as keystroke logging, but it cannot cover everything. So brain uh, activity could provide additional um, insights. Actually, my colleagues and I, with some neuroscientists from Tohoku University, are in the process of exploring this possibility. Hopefully, we can report on the results of our research soon. I thought I would share this photo video. This was part of a pilot uh, when I had the opportunity experience an fMRI scan myself at Tohoku University. We even piloted whether uh, we can write in the uh, machine, and it is possible, however unlikely uh, this might uh, seem. Of course, this research uh, will suffer from ecological uh, validity, but we gain in other uh, respects. Ooh, and I also wanted to share that this is actually a result of my brain scare. Please don't share this with anyone, although the talk is being recorded, so I guess that's okay. 
And finally, I also wanted to call for research, more research, uh, which is longitudinal, in the, uh, more longitudinal in, this, uh, in nature. This, is, this does not only apply to writing research, but this is also an issue in the larger field of SLA. We should conduct more longitudinal studies to capture how writing processes change over time. The two PhD students, Ting Sheng and Xing Kuang, were actually working on this moment, uh, on this topic at the moment. I'm really excited to learn about their results. Finally, um, I'd like to say a big thank you to IELTS British Council and ETS for financial support and also Bimali Indrarathne for help with data analysis. And those of you who might be interested to learn more about this topic, methodological issues in uh, investigating writing processes, you might want to have a look at the 2019 special issue of SSLA, uh, which has been dedicated uh, to this issue. And I think I'm going to stop here. So thank you for your attention. Um. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you Professor uh, Breves for that very, very interesting talk on uh, especially the methodological implications of, of, I think it's really brilliant triangulating three very different methods of eye tracking, keystroke logging and simulated recall to really get at uh, trying to understand the writing processes of, um, of our learners. And then after that, the neural imaging part, that, that's just uh, you know the icing on the cake, that's really, Exciting. I think it's still ongoing, but exciting. Yeah, yeah. We're really, we're looking forward to uh, uh, to your research uh, in that uh, field. So we have about twenty minutes left for Q and A session, and we have we have nine questions. And I encourage all the participants to to um, uh, to to ask uh, more if we have time. And then I'll just turn over to our moderators for the for the Q and A. Um, thank you so much, Peter. And of course, thank you, Dr. Rivez, for that outstanding talk. So our first question is, how, um, how is the planning phase of L2 writing usually addressed? For example, are learners instructed to create an outline for their writing? How is co uh, coherence of argumentation analyzed and interpreted? Well, it really depends, right? I mean, the, in, in the studies I, I, I shared uh, with you, these were highly controlled studies, these were testing tasks, and we didn't give any instruction to our participants how to plan. It was interesting though, again, this is why I think it would be really uh, helpful to do, uh, adopt more of a case study approach and, and also look at qualitatively what participants do. Again, we didn't uh, do this study yet, but we noticed that actually when it comes to planning, participants engaged in quite, did this in a very different way. Some participants would start outlining, you know, put like one, two, three, four. Others wouldn't write anything on the screen. They might, um, I think probably the planning uh, occurred in, in, in their head. So there's a lot of individual uh, variation. Um, this study was about, wasn't about instruction, but of course, when it comes to writing instruction, um, planning is a really important stage, right? And students are usually encouraged to plan and uh, come up with an outline and so on. But I haven't researched this uh, myself when it, uh, in, when it comes to instruction. Oh, there was another part of the, of the question, something related to argumentative writing, which I don't think I addressed. Would you mind repeating what it was? Absolutely. How is coherence of argumentation analyzed and interpreted? Okay, again, this wasn't part of this study, and I, but I've done a bit of research on this, but that was more from a quantitative um, perspective. We used co-metrics and other corpus linguistic software uh, to look at uh, coherence, and these are available. But again, this is a quantitative approach. There are also um, qualitative ways of, of looking at this. And another interesting area for, for research is, and again, I haven't talked about this, but we're also working on this to look at how writing processes actually relate to the writing product, coherence, accuracy, and so on. Thank you. Thanks again, Dr. Revis, for your excellent talk. So uh, the second question we received is, is about the methodology. Did all the participants were shown all of their essays for the purpose of stimulate stimuli recall or just part of it? Yes, um, I, I was going fast and it might not have been clear. When it comes to, the, in the first study, they only wrote one essay, so they've seen it all. In the second study, we only asked them to engage in stimulated recall based on the last performance. 
because if you had done that before, uh, then it would have led to a massurgical problem reactivity, right? Once you start focusing or, or reflecting on your thought processes and then you write again, this might actually change the writing process itself. So this is why we only focused on the last performance when it comes to stimulated recall. We could have done more, but then the memory uh, decay issue comes into play if too much time has passed. Great, thank you. Our next question is, is it acceptable to use a first language writing model for a second language writing research? That's a really good question. Um, there are not specific uh, models to add to writing, and most of the writing researchers actually adopt models from first language writing. And when I publish in this topic, one of the questions always came up, but why this model? Why did you uh, adopt Kellogg's model of writing? And our rationale for using this model, is, and, and this is quite common in the uh, to field, although there are other uh, writing models, it puts greater emphasis on linguistic encoding processes. And of course, when it comes to second language writers, they tend to struggle more with linguistic encoding processes, how to you know, um, encode lexis or grammar than first language writers. Thank you. Our next question is actually from Tim Hall. <laughs> Uh, he said he's familiar with uh, Level's speech model production, but he wanted to know more about um, Kellogg's model in compare slash contrast. Um, if you look at the two models, there are quite a few similarities, right? Um, in terms of in Leifert's model, you, you would refer to conceptualization, and in this model, you refer to planning. Um, there are similarities, but of course, when it comes to writing, there are, it's not so much reflected in the model, but there are basic differences. You have more time to plan, um, and these processes happen in parallel, but still time is less of an issue. But in terms of the model, I think it's a good observation. They are quite similar. Awesome, thank you. Actually, I think Tim had a follow-up question which was, to what extent is a model of reading processes included in an understanding of this model um, of the writing process? Because it's not just a purely output-based construct if there's also monitoring post hoc. Um, we can't say the same about speaking um, because uh, with listening as a type of monitor monitoring post hoc. Oh, wow, you're asking me difficult questions, but this is a really exciting question. I agree. Reading is an important part of writing. But if you think about it, when we reread what we write, when it comes to the planning stage, in, so when it comes to planning, part of planning is rereading, right? And also when it comes to monitoring, part of it is rereading. Uh, but I don't think, at least I'm not aware of it, but I, I'm, I might be wrong. I, uh, I haven't done research on, on, on this area yet. But I don't think any attempts have been made to, to include reading models explicitly in writing, at least when it comes to, I think there is more and more research on, on integrated writing tasks. And I, I've done um, a bit of that myself, then reading models are included. So, but it's a really good point. Um, I, I'd love to look into this a bit more. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, thanks. Our next question uh, is, uh, what direct connections can be made between pauses in writing and the involvement of specific higher order thinking skills and the lack, the lack thereof? Okay, so if I understand correctly, the question asks whether where we pause in writing, how it relates to uh, higher order writing processes? Yes, any connection between... Uh, yes, in our first study, yeah. what we found, and this is something that emerges from um, actually quite a few studies, and there seems to be a clear uh, trend, when uh, writers pause between larger textual units, such as sentences, they tend to engage in higher order writing processes, such as planning content uh, and organization. And when they pause at lower uh, textual units, such as between words or or in, even within words, they tend to be associated with not all the time, but you know, if we look at uh, proportions um, with lower writing, uh, lower level writing processes. But if we just looked at, and this was my point in, 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 uh, in these studies, if we only looked at keystroke logging, um, we couldn't be sure, right? So it's really important to triangulate um, this type of data with stimulated recall and other methods um, to have more valid conclusions about this. Fantastic, thank you. 
Um, we do have a few questions regarding eye tracking. Um, first, how do you measure pace or more specifically the pauses that you were referring to? And also, could you recommend a good font size for eye trackers, such as the Toby or the iLink? Yes. Um... Pace, I think per perhaps uh, um, what I should start with, and, and I didn't get to this, but one limitation of our research in both cases was that the eye checker and the keystroke locking software, they were not linked. It's possible to do this now, but we were in the first study, um, probably it might not have been possible, I'm not sure, but we were not aware of this. In the second study, when it comes to the, the TOEFL study, we could have done this, but it just, the software wasn't compatible with the TOEFL um, environment, but ideally you would link this. So what we did, we looked at the keystroke logging software, we identified pauses there, we had timestamps from the keystroke logging software, and we looked for the same timestamps in the eye checking data. And then in this way, we were able to triangulate this. But again, uh, ideally this would be done automatically. And uh, the second question, there was a second part of the question. Could you remind me of that? Yes, the font size that you would recommend. Oh, the font size. Um, yes, uh, that was actually an issue with uh, our TOEFL writing study because the font size was too small. We were not able to look at, the, to, to do the um, detailed analysis that we had before. Oh, I, I remember correctly what we did, what we used in our, uh, we paid attention to this in our IR study. I think it was font size, maybe 14, 16. I don't remember from the top of my head, uh, but if you're interested, you can look at our paper uh, in SSLA 2019. It's, um, uh, and then you will find this detailed information, but definitely it's important to have large uh, sample size, uh, not sample sizes, uh, font sizes. Great, that's good to know. Um, so our next question is about triangulation. Um, don't you think eye tracking and st stimulate recall methods overlap to some degree? Eye tracking and stimulated recall? Uh, I don't think so, right? Because what eye tracking tells us, it shows where we're looking at the screen or whatever visual stimulus we, um, we interact with. And these processes could be either explicit or implicit. We might be conscious of those eye movements or we might not be, right? And it's a concurrent measure. It really captures what we were doing in terms of eye gaze behaviors. When it comes to stimulated recall, it provides information about conscious processes, right? So the stimulated recall could not tell us, you know, what we were, um, some of, some of the, the, the th thoughts we had, we, we might not have uh, been aware of. But there might be some overlap. Indeed, uh, some of the, um, our eye gaze behaviors we might be aware of, but I think both of them add something uh, to the bigger uh, picture. Um, so the next question is, do you think sex or gender would affect your results? Um, it was noticed that many of the <laughs> participants were females. So would it yes. be necessary to have like an equal number? That's an interesting question. I wish we could have, you know, more equal representation of gender. This was a practical constraint. Maybe it's the same case at TC. We were working our graduate students and when it comes to postgraduate students in applied linguistics, they tend to be, there is a larger proportion of female students, but I don't know uh, any research looking into gender differences in the, when it comes to eye checking in the context of writing, but but to be honest, I, I wouldn't expect uh, differences. I, I, I can't think of a, a theoretical rationale for that. But maybe, maybe I just haven't thought uh, you know, uh, enough about this yet. Um, our next question is about the, um, the writing model, the five stages. So what was the logic behind um, dividing the writing into five stages? And Very good know? question. Uh, as I mentioned towards the end of the presentation, ideally we would look at moment to moment, uh, you know, I guess behaviors and keystroke logging, but it had practical limitation. Um, we had practical limitations. Doing that type of analysis would have been extremely time consuming, and we just didn't have the capacity to do that. But actually, we did better than some of the existing research. They tended to uh, divide the writing process into three. Um, instead of five, five writing stages, but five is ad hoc. There is no particular rationale uh, to that. But it's a good question. I wish we could have had, uh, we could have looked into um, even more stages. Great. 
Um, so um, one participant mentioned that it would be interesting to explore how instruction affects writing fluency. Is there any work already available in the field or are you planning on looking into that? Um, I don't think there is any work um, looking um, at writing processes using these various data sources. So, but there is some research looking at writing instruction and, and uh, uh, keystroke logging behaviors, not much. Uh, and as I mentioned, one of my PhD students, Ding Zhang actually, um, is doing a longitudinal study on writing processes. And what she's planning to do, she's also going to look at uh, writing instruction. She have a task-based writing course and she's going to see how that influences um, task-based writing behaviors and processes. Unfortunately, she won't be able to triangulate all of these data sources. It will be a classroom-based study, but she's planning to do keystroke logging and stimulated recall. Eye checking would just be too complicated when you, when you go into a classroom. Thanks. Um, our next question is about uh, data analysis. Uh, what suggestion would you provide for students who use only sti stimulated recall protocol to investigate writing process? Well, if you can, <laughs> try to triangulate with, with other data sources as well. But stimulated recall can also you know, generate a lot of good insights into the writing process. I'm sure if you're doing this study, you're familiar with Alison Mackey and Susan Gus' work and all the advice about how to do stimulated recall in a valid way. I think that's the most important thing, just to keep to those methodological recommendations so the data can be as valid and as reliable as as possible. We also have a um, follow-up question on the use of uh, sti stimulated recall. Like, should it be conducted in the participants' first first language? Or their yes. Um, ideally, you would conduct it in the participants' first language. And and in our first study, uh, you might remember uh, we were not able to do that. Although participants had really high level of proficiency, they were university students, like probably many of you. So it didn't seem to be a problem that they had to um, engage in the stimulated recall in English. But ideally, it would have been um, at least they should have had the choice between their first and second language. In the second study, as I mentioned, we had um, an RA who was a Mandarin speaker. So we did conduct uh, the stimulated recall comments in uh, procedure in Mandarin. But interestingly, it was, there was a lot of code switching, right? A bit of English here, a bit of Mandarin there. But ideally, I think you, you would have um, a, a researcher who can speak the participant's first language. And of course, proficiency. If you have lower level proficiencies, no way you could do it in their, in their uh, second language. Awesome, thank you. Um, could you please talk a bit how, about how you conducted the time-locked analysis for the different writing stages? Okay, um, as I mentioned, um, we divided the writing process into five uh, stages, but um, the total writing time was different for participants. So I mentioned 30 minutes, but someone might have written for, let's say, 25 minutes. So then each stage would have been five minutes. And then we calculated all of the indices, the keystroke logging, the eye checking indices, and also we looked at the stimulated recall separately for each of these stages. And then we conducted the analysis that I described. Uh, maybe I should mention that uh, the way we did this, we look at the total writing time, but there are also writing studies who use verbal protocols. They don't look at, look at the time span, but some of these studies actually look at the number of verbal protocol comments, and they might divide these into equal proportions. That's another way of uh, going about this. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, our next question is about conducting uh, longitudinal studies on the writing processes. Um, so uh, will the data be directly comparable, uh, given that, you know, the writers may have different cycle, uh, there's also social st uh, status and also maybe different writing paths will be used. So will the data yeah, this, is a, mm -hmm, this is a really interesting methodical problem, um, but I think it's not Im impossible to solve. What you might want to do is uh, make sure that you develop comparable writing prompts. Um, it takes a long time to do that, right? But you can have judges, you can have participants, um, you know, who do all these uh, writing prompts prior to the study, and then you counterbalance them. 
and so on. But if the study is really longitudinal, it can be tricky because participants develop. If you have a year, probably the same writing task will be okay. But if you look at, you know, let's say a three year longitudinal study, uh, then um, you will need to, to make the writing task more complex. Then I don't have an answer. I would need to, to think uh, more about this, but this is an interesting challenge. Thank you. Uh, so how were you able to pair the synchronous eye movements with the reflective process of, of the participants? Um, I'm not entirely sure in terms of data analysis or, or uh, I, I guess so, right? Again, um, what we, we did uh, looked at, um, we were able to see when, when we did the stimulated echo comments, we replayed the recording of a participant's writing process. So what they were able to see, they were able to see their keystroke lungs and also their eye gaze movement. So we knew exactly when they commented on, you know, a particular pose or revision behavior. And uh, I know this is not part of the question, but this is also tricky and, and, and it would be an interesting further methodical investigation, uh, whether the presence of eye movements actually leads to further interpretation, right? Because as I said, some of the eye movements are not conscious, okay? So participants actually see things that they might not have been aware of. So it would be interesting to investigate how this um, interferes uh, with the stimulated recall methodology. But in this study, we thought it was better to have more stimulus than, than, than less stimulus, but it's a methodological issue to, to look into. Thank you. Um, our next question is about the uh, the measurement of, of the participants' overall proficiency. So, what was the rationale uh, for measuring the overall proficiency with reading and listening scores only? <laughs> I wish we could have, you know, um, administered the whole TOEFL test, um, and that would have uh, provided us with a with a more reliable measure of overall proficiency. And again, this is something we. Um, we had mixed uh, you know, uh, thoughts about because we had writing proficiency scores through the actual writing performances, right? And these were TOEFL scores. So another possibility could have been that we use the writing proficiency scores that we derive from, um, um, from participants, you know, TOEFL performances in the actual study. But then the issue is then there is circularity, right? Because we're looking at proficiency, which is derived from our own dependent uh, variable. So we made this choice, but again, uh, this is not ideal. But I should also say, just to, to save ourselves, we um, ran correlations between the various um, components of, um, of TOEFL and the correlations were quite strong. Uh, between the writing scores, the reading and listening scores, which is not surprising. So probably this was okay. But again, I wish we had, you know, the uh, full proficiency score. Having said this again, there might be some testing uh, people in the audience. Um, uh, compared to most writing studies, actually our um, measure of proficiency was a lot more sophisticated. Most studies usually just have a, a 20 minute, uh, 20 minute C test or maybe the Oxford placement uh, test. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Vives. Um, this is, unfortunately, this is all the time we have um, for today's event. Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, obviously, our guest speaker for today's uh, very informative and interesting talk, uh, as, well, as well as our, our panelists, our moderators, and all the participants that join us today. Thank you so much. Uh, please stay tuned for the, the recording of this talk. We'll be on our YouTube channel and our next semester as, as we have, we'll have more series of, of events coming. Um, thank you so much. And, um, and hope, hopefully everyone will have a, a very nice, uh, uh, wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you.